This recording was produced by Oregon Trail Baptist Church. If you'd like to get more recordings or to leave your feedback, please visit us at www.otbchurch.com or write us at P.O. Box 298, Guernsey, Wyoming, 82214. We look forward to hearing from you, and we hope that today's recording will not just challenge your thinking, but will transform your life. seated. We are still on Abraham following God's promise. Lesson seven, but it says lesson six. Yes, that one. Should look like this. All right, so lesson seven, and it should say uh, following uh, God's faithfulness despite relapse. And we've been talking about this instance in Genesis 20 and 21 where what takes place in these chapters. Maybe slow coverage of these is good because it takes us about three weeks to cover it and then kind of get the story in our mind by the end. Genesis 20. What happens in Genesis 20? The title for Lesson 7 is God's Faithfulness Despite Relapse. Okay, yeah, Abraham lies about his sister, but what takes place? Why did he lie about his, sis- his half-sister? Okay, why was he in danger of being killed? Well, he probably wasn't in danger of being killed, but he sure thought he was. Who does he encounter in this chapter? Abimelech, okay? Abimelech, who is the king of Ger- Gerar or Gerar, um, that later becomes the Philistines. And so Abraham comes into uh, Abimelech's territory. He says to his wife again, hey, let's... He brings up the old sin from Egypt where he lied about his wife. And it didn't go so well in Egypt, but for some reason he thought it'd go well this time. And it didn't go so well again. <laughs> We should know better, shouldn't we? (laughs) But yet we see that in our own lives, don't we? Uh, And then we begin, as we covered the story, we we looked at at Abraham, who who is the righteous one, who should be righteous, is definitely not acting righteous. And then Abimelech, who, as he's presented in the story, on your first assumption, you're assuming, okay, he's a pagan king, he's going to act unrighteously, he's not... And like Abraham, well, he doesn't fear the Lord. And who acts righteous in this story? Abimelech. So, um, and then God comes to Abimelech and says, you're but a dead man because you've taken another man's wife. And Abimelech's like, wait a minute. I didn't have a clue. And he, he I wouldn't say he argues with God, but he pleads with, pleads with God based on God is just. And Abimelech, he... He did, it, did not do this um, deliberately. He was lied to. Um, so he would restore Sarah. We are on page 10, picking up the story today. Um, this is under the heading of a closer look where we're kind of, after we've gone over the story, we come back and dig into some of the details. Um, we are at page 10 E. Abraham justifies his actions. Now, you know, Abimelech at this point has confronted Abraham about the lie, about, hey, why did you tell me this was your sister and not your wife? Um, and, Ab- and Abraham's response, uh, Genesis 20, verse 11. And Abraham said, Because I thought, surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will slay me for my wife's sake. So he's justifying himself, or trying to, based on they don't fear God. The irony is, look at Abimelech's officers and how they responded to what their king told them. In verse 8, 
Therefore Abimelech rose early in the morning and called all his servants and told all these things in their ears, and the men were sore afraid. As we look at this, Abraham assumed what about these people? He assumed they were ungodly and they would act ungodly. To save himself, what did he do? He lied. He, he lied. <laughs> yeah. He puts his wife in jeopardy. He lies. He puts the promise of God in jeopardy to save his own neck. Did he not fight fire with fire? In his mind, he's assuming Abimelech is wicked so and ungodly. And so Abraham's response to that, instead of going to the Lord about it, he responds by doing this, living, living ungodly. Uh, two wrongs don't make a right. Um, there you go. The ends don't justify the means. Um, isn't that... It's very easy to try to think, okay, this is the desired effect we want. Well, this person's not going to cooperate, so we, we might use some means that are a bit fleshly, but we're going for the desired end of work. Because the moment we do that, we take our life into our hands. We put ourselves on the throne of our life instead of God being on the throne of our life. And we, dic we call the shots, we dictate what's going to happen because we want to see the end justify the means. I think also when we are consumed with ourselves and flesh, that we don't consider how it affects everyone else. We lose vision, don't we? Does sin have consequences? Does it always have consequences? Do we always see them? Maybe not, but it always has consequences. But yeah. But in the moment of temptation, what's the devil hiding? Or he's going to try to hide the consequences. And so what we do in a moment of weakness, whether harsh words or, or mean actions or um, a fleshly response, it affects other people. And you finally get to a point where Maybe you finally see how it affects other people and, and it upsets you, but you can't do anything to stop it because your sin has already affected other people. And every, even our personal sins. Now, what do you think I mean by personal sins? I mean, if I walked up to Nicole and I slapped her in the face, okay, that would be a sin between me and Nicole, right? That would be very rude and bad. Michael's shaking his head no. Obviously, I think we need to pray for Michael that he get a work of grace in his heart. Um, okay. However, you know there's sins that we can commit without leaving our home and our house. There's sins we can commit while being by ourselves. And they're more personal sins. They're more of maybe ideas we hold on to that are not biblical or maybe a, an attitude of pride we like to hold. And we, we think it's personal, but it's really not. It, it, it comes out and everybody notices. We just don't think they do. Um, but those personal sins where maybe we're not willing, God says something to us and we're not willing to obey and nobody else may have a clue what's going on in our heart and life, but we have, we've resisted God. We don't think that's going to affect others, but it does. And I don't know if I can even draw the line of how it does. But God can. And uh, Abraham here, 
thought the ends would justify the means and didn't work out so well, did it? Comments or questions before we keep going here? What's that? Do you have a handout, Dory? Oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> you want to grab her one? So. Why don't you print two, babe? Print three. <laughs> print three. We might end up with more coming in. Top of page 11. Abraham feared man rather than God and repeated his previous sin. Whereas the men who did not know God feared him. Abimelech and his men obeyed unquestionably after their first encounter with God. And they did so at the earliest possible opportunity. <laughs> That's all right. Um, it's interesting here, that there's a, that box that says a quick bit. There's the Hebrew word here that describes reverence or respect or awe for God. It's not just fear. It's, it's that whole attitude of respect and awe for who God is. It's, it's recounted here, the middle of the text box, in Genesis 20, verse 8, when Abimelech recounted his interaction with God the night before, he and his court officials responded with reverence and awe. Ironically, Abraham lied because he thought that the men of Gerar did not fear God. This is going to bring back maybe, some, uh, I guess, a, I don't want to say a pet peeve, but when our view of God is ever before us, whether you want to call it walking in the Spirit, or whether you want to call it uh, praying without ceasing, when, when we are constantly in communion with God, we're not going to sin. Now, at any moment, I'm not saying we're never going to sin, okay? At any moment, we can, when we step out of fellowship with God, we, can, we step right into sin. And as one preacher put it, you can't, you can't love nothing. Either you love God and you serve Him, or you love yourself and Satan's system. Love is not in a vacuum. And so, here, Abraham, he should have been communing with God. He should have been living in awe and respect of who God is. And you all know how it is. Oops. Oh, I was yesterday when my phone went off twice. And, uh, oh. It was the second time. I turned the volume all the way down on my phone. And then I, I gave it to, they were doing the Bible quizzing, and I gave it to John so he could play a game. And sure enough, once that game opened up, the volume went all the way to full blast. And I don't know how that works, but anyway. Where was I? <laughs> okay, when, we're, when we have a close relationship with God, when we fear God, okay, when someone's looking over your shoulder, does that change your behavior? Yeah. Generally. Even when we do the right when we're doing the right thing, it still makes us a little nervous, right? Why? <laughs> yeah. You know, we all make enough mistakes, don't we? And half the time when we make a mistake, we can correct it ourselves. But, but the fact that someone else is watching and they know we made the mistake um, could be nerve-wracking. I had a friend in college. He could program with computers and do that stuff. And he did a job interview. And he had he, the job interview. He sat down with his computer. And these guys in Germany had connected to his computer so they could see his screen. And they gave him this. We want you to do this programming task. And they sat there the whole time watching everything he did on the computer to see if they wanted him as a programmer. Now, he got a little bit nervous and he was rusty on his programming. He didn't end up getting the job. Um, that's okay. He's now actually over in Africa working with children ministry there. And it was just going to be a side job for him. But that, 
that presence of someone watching you. Now, the person watching makes all the difference. We all get nervous, whether it's our own parents watching us, whether it's our friends watching us, whether it's our spouse watching us, we get a little nervous, and we're nip and tuck. But how is it when someone's watching you who they've already got, they've already got a burr under their saddle against you? They're looking for something. You're really nervous, right? The point is, we are living with a Heavenly Father watching everything we do. When we live in light of that, it makes us think twice before we act, doesn't it? Now, God, God is not a mean ogre. He doesn't have a burr under his saddle against us that he's going to just beat us over the head as soon as we make a mistake. However, if we live more in light of, okay, God's watching right now. God knows what I'm thinking. God knows what I'm focusing on. When we live in light of that, doesn't it seem like it's an awful good deterrent to sin? <laughs> it should be. <laughs> but often because we don't live in light of that, because we're not communing with God, because we don't... We would believe that God knows everything we do, but we don't live in light of that, we end up doing what Abraham did. And uh, he was a man just like we are. Well, he was a person just like us, and we all fail on the same front too. Comments or questions before we move on to God's correction here? All right, page 11, God's correction. God used an unrighteous king to correct his righteous servant. Talk about irony. Abimelech showed himself to be morally superior to Abraham by appealing to seemingly uni the universal value system. Thou hast done deeds unto me that ought not to be done. That Abraham ignored. There were certain laws and things that he had ignored. Uh, he had bypassed with the whole, hey, she's my sister. Page 12 at the top, whereas Abimelech offered Abraham offered Abraham un, uh, offended, thank you, offended Abraham unintentionally, Abraham acted deliberately, motivated by self-preservation. He thought that Abimelech would choose to kill him rather than commit adultery. And he considered Gerar to be without fear of God or respect for human life. Ab Abraham in his mind, apparently, there was this. There were laws on the code. I mean, you didn't have the Mosaic Law at this point, but there was the law of God written on their hearts. And guess what? Over time, men wrote those laws out with things such as Hammurabi's Code and all these ancient law codes. And apparently, it was a better thing to kill a man than it was to commit adultery. Even in ancient law codes, you just you didn't take another man's wife. Okay? They had that sense of right and wrong, whether they were religious or not. Abraham seemed to ignore all of that. And it's quite amazing when we step into the flesh how far we can go and quickly. F here, Abraham continues to justify his actions. Um, verse 12 of our chapter, And yet indeed she is my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. Now, this would later be forbidden in the Mosaic Code. Let's go back before Abraham. Who did Cain and Abel marry? Their sisters. And who do you think their kids married? Their sisters or cousins, all right? And who... And who do you think their kids married? Family, all right? That was okay at that point. I think scientifically, I mean, the Bible doesn't say this, but I think scientifically the gene pool was still very rich at that point. It's when, over time, the breakdown and the diversity of you know, our genes are more limited and all that. And I, 
I could have some scientist explain that to you better than I can. But the point is, by the Mosaic law, it was now illegal. It was against the law to marry your sister. In fact, in some states in the U.S., they still do blood tests to make sure you're not too closely related before you can marry. Not, I don't. Do they do that in Wyoming? You used to always do it. So, wouldn't it be an awkward thing to find out you're closely related to somebody and you didn't know it? <laughs> Generally, we know who our family is, so we, we don't tend to marry our. our <laughs> yeah, two passages here that deal with it is Leviticus 20, verse 17, and Deuteronomy 27, verse 22. And both of those are re reiterating, don't, don't get married to your family. <laughs> don't have relations with your family. Now, this is all pre-law, and it may not seem significant. This is before the Mosaic Law. But why is this important? As you all scan the handout, trying to find the answer real quick. Why, why, why is it important to take note that this was before the law and Abraham had married his half-sister? What's that? He wasn't breaking the law. I'm going to add one more thing to this that the Jews taught. Um, what does this prove, page 13? It proved that Abraham did not keep the Mosaic law as the Jewish rabbis taught. They taught that, now you have to understand the Jews, they're going to elevate the law. Torah, the law to them is the highest, I mean, it's, it almost becomes an idol in Jewish theology. They taught that because Abraham walked with God, he kept the law of Moses before it was even given at Mount Sinai. This here proves he didn't. Uh, the quote there on page 13 in that darker box, Abraham lived before there was law, or the Mosaic law would be specific here. How could he have commend, commended himself to God by keeping the law hundreds of years before the law was given? The rabbis answered that Abraham kept the law by anticipation. In fact, Jewish orthodoxy stated that Abraham kept the law, therefore he assured him by an oath that the nations should be blessed in his seed. The point is of this, what are the Jews emphasizing when they're saying that Abraham kept the law before it was given? What button are they really pushing? Well, they didn't really have the law. They didn't have it, but what, what is, what's the motivation for why they would want to or need to prove that Abraham kept the law before there was a law? Okay, he's one of their famous people, yes. The Pharisees of Christ's day, what were they concerned about? Keeping the law. And they had added to the law. They had a whole burden they had added. The point is, the focus is on works, not on God's grace. In the story of Abraham, we know that Abraham was justified in the sight of God. Period. He was. That came in chapter 15. We're in chapter 20. He's not living like it, is he? But he's still a child of God. The Jews really want to push that point that Abraham kept the law. And when they interpret some of these Old Testament passages... They twist the whole passage to try to make up a whole story. So yeah, he kept the law. It just sounds like he did. But it's really hard for him to get around. He married his half-sister, which is against the Mosaic law. And then they say, well, he kept the law. The point is, for us in our lives, we have to... The law is important. Well, even Old Testament law, it guides us into truth. You know, we, we live in... We're coming up on tourist time where people are going to be coming through Guernsey and Oregon Trail. They want to see the ruts. You know, had most of the pioneers who came across on the Oregon Trail, had they honored the Old Testament laws about sanitation, 
they probably wouldn't have died of dysentery. But well, <laughs> that's tr that is true too, you know. But but there's there were some things they were doing. It's like you know if if you if you follow your Bible a little bit more closely, you'd see well that, that's not a good idea. Um, the same is true of of a lot. Of, I mean, a lot of Old Testament laws that we look at. It's like yes, they may not be directly impacting my life today, but some of them are the core behind our society. And the law gives us a window into who God is. But the law is not how we please God. We failed on that, and we have failed on that, and we failed on that because we all sin. We need grace. Uh, this, the quote there at the bottom, the lighter box, how does this apply to me? God deals with you and me based on our known sin. In Psalm 19, the psalmist asks for forgiveness of his known and unknown sins, and certainly it is good to ask for forgiveness of the sins that we unknowingly commit. However, the sins that primarily cause a lack of fellowship with God are the known sins that we harbor and are unwilling to confess. In our lives, if we take the approach of the Jews, what we're going to tend to do is look at the garden of our life. We're going to be constantly picking weeds. We're going to constantly have our nose in the dirt. And you know how it is. You get all of them out today, and what happens tomorrow? They're back. And then you see some people's gardens, and the weeds are like this tall, you know. Um, and we, get, we can get so caught up in the pulling of weeds from our life that we can lose the joy of gardening. <laughs> now, I don't have a joy of gardening anyway, all right? Uh, but do you realize how in our Christian life we can get so focused on pulling the sins out of our life and rooting out the sins that we lose the joy of our Savior? We've shifted our focus when we do that. We've shifted our focus from looking to Jesus to looking at our sins and ourself. And even though we're looking at ourselves so we can try to attain some sort of I'm pleasing Jesus, what we do, we've lost sight of the Savior. We can't see the forest for the trees. And we, we, we can get burdened down and the Christian life becomes a burden instead of a blessing. Does that make sense? Um, and you know how it is. You weed your garden. You go over it today. There's weeds you didn't see, but now that they're a little bigger tomorrow, you see them. <laughs> or give it a week, you see them. Our life is that way. Today we sit down and we're maybe having our cup of coffee and our Bible and we're praying with the Lord. And so we say, Lord, is there any sin in our life? And we deal with something. And in a few days or a week, we... We're doing through the same, we're, we're reading our Bible, we're praying, Lord, is there any sin in my, our life? And he reveals something that's kind of come to the surface that we didn't see yesterday, but now we see today. We can deal with it. But we don't have to beat ourselves over the head because, oh, I didn't confess that yesterday. You weed the garden with what you see, what you know. Are there seeds of little weeds in the garden? You bet. <laughs> And they're going to come up. But we have to walk with our eyes on Jesus, not on ourselves. And there's a slight shift there because we want to look at ourselves because we think that in looking at ourselves and cleaning ourselves up, we'll please Jesus. But when you lose the heart of it, when you lose sight of the Savior, it's all for nothing. Comments, questions? It's called and it is really hard to get rid of. And, and I'm studying how to get rid of it out of my car. I found that it can lie dormant for 20 years, and if the conditions are right, it can come back. And it's actually known as buying me, and I'd like to say that some of the things that we think we've dealt with is like a fighting view of the heart. Because if, we, if, if things are in the right 
condition or circumstance that can come back even 20 years later and be no. a Christian walk sometimes in a way that has really hit me. We need to be weeding our garden, but at the same time, we can't be discouraged of, okay, what's my bindweed in my life? It could be there. That's fine. Let the Holy Spirit show it to you, okay? Because um, in, in looking for our own bindweeds, we can become introspective where we're looking at ourselves and discouraging. But yeah, we do have those sin that bindweed. <laughs> That's a great illustration. It comes back. I had someone tell me goat heads, which are such a pesky. I was told someone this spring said a goat head can lie dormant for a hundred years. I don't know if that's true or not. I haven't looked it up. But that's a long time to lie dormant. Yeah. Yeah. We had um, we had someone stay here in the auditorium with the air mattress. Well, that was a bad deal because people walked back and forth, and sure enough, a goat head got the air mattress. And yeah, <laughs> never found the hole. But the the you know they can lie dormant for a long time. And what Mrs. Driscoll said about conditions. Most of us don't know our own heart until we're put in the condition that's revealed. You don't know the flavor of the tea bag until you put it in the hot water. You may smell it. You may put it in cold water. But it's not going to have the same effect until it goes into hot water. And uh, when the right circumstances come our way, a little bit of bitterness, and I'm not, it could be bitterness as a sin, but you know, that bitter flavor comes out, and we're going, ooh, maybe that wasn't so good, but it can lie dormant and undetected. Um, good. G here on page 13, Abimelech restores Sarah. In this process, he gave many gifts to her and to him. He gave them an invitation to sojourn wherever they pleased in Gerar. And then Abraham prays for God's healing on the king's household. Since God was about to fill his promise, the promise of having a son, he had to intercede. If left to Abraham and Sarah, who repeatedly jeopardized God's plan, the promise not, might not have been fulfilled. It was realized only by the grace of God. Do you realize you and I are the biggest li liability God's ha God has? I know it sounds strange because really in one sense God has no liabilities because he's sovereign and controls everything, but <laughs> the whole human race is one big liability, all right? <laughs> Nothing else in creation resists God, but human, well, let me take that back. Demons do, all right? But humans, we have resisted God. We constantly, even the ones who love God, we blow it. And over and over. And here God had to step in between Sarah, Abimelech, and Abraham. God stepped in to avoid an even further disaster. And aren't you glad that even when we blow it, God is... God's there. God, God, God can make things to where the consequences quite aren't what they could be. God can put the brakes so the accident that we are creating in our own lives is not what it could be. We have a God who's loving and caring for us, and even when we're doing wrong, he intercedes to keep us from going too far. And... Uh, I'm thankful God stepped in. God loves us. God loves us. Yes, he does. Abraham and Abimelech, then, they make a covenant one with another. 
I, we have to read this. I, I just have to almost chuckle with this covenant. 21, Genesis 21, verses 20 to 34, 22 to 34. And it came to pass that when Abraham and Pichol, the chief captain of his host, spake or with Abimelech and Pichol, the chief captain of his host, came and uh, spake unto Abraham, saying, God is with thee in all that thou doest. Boy, uh, almost a slap in the face. I mean, they're saying that, but boy, Abraham sure blown it, and God still is working on his behalf. Verse 23, Now therefore swear unto me here by God that thou wilt not deal falsely with me, nor with my son, nor with my son's son, but according to the kindness that I have done unto thee, thou shalt do unto me, and to the land wherein thou hast sojourned. Hey, why don't we be honest with one another, okay? And would you be honest with my kids and their kids, all right? Uh, deal honestly with me. Abraham had not, Abimelech had been honest. Verse 24, And Abraham said, I will swear. And Abraham reproved Abimelech because of a well of water, which Abimelech's servants had violently taken away. And Abimelech said, I want not who hath done this thing. Neither did thou tell me. Um, I'll skip out here. So there's this well that Abraham had, and then the Abimelech's servants were fighting and taking over it. Again, it was another situation. Abimelech was oblivious to what was going on. He didn't know. He was ignorant. Um, I'm not saying he was stupid. He just didn't know. His immediate response was he dealt with the problem. He dealt with it. He, he gave it back. Um, we should really be like Abimelech in this passage. <laughs> Abraham didn't know like, about the well, but when, he, when it was brought to his attention, he dealt with it. And he did what was right. Uh, he dealt honestly with Abraham, even when Abraham did not deal honestly with Abimelech. And uh, so the, the, this covenant that they were going to honor and be honorable and honest with one another was put to the test over a well, which I'd say a dumb well, but I mean, it's not dumb because water is a very source of life and necessary. Um, and so that had taken place. So we close out today, a couple questions. Recall a time in our life, your life, when God's faithfulness contrasted to your faithfulness. What did your experience of God, continued faithfulness, teach you about his character? And how did it inspire you to live or to be more confident in your faith? How has God been faithful to you when you have made, been unfaithful? I'm going to pull the, this is the elephant in the room. We're all still alive, okay? None of us have been struck dead, and we all know we're sinners. We have a faithful God. But what else? Do you love your kids when they're doing wrong? No, yeah. 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 Exactly. I'm kicking them out. But there's been parents who do that. You know? But isn't that, that is not how our God behaves, is it? Yeah, this may not apply so closely, but yesterday we were driving home from Cheyenne and somebody had given Andrew a balloon and bless their heart, they overinflated it so it was really tight. So you get give a little kid a, little, a tight balloon with no pliability and it popped in the car. And yeah, it gave us all a heart attack. After the heart attack, came the weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Now, now that he, he had carefully cared for that balloon, and it was a joy and a delight to him, and it was gone. Now, in a puff. That happens in our lives over and over. As daddy, we stopped at Safeway, and they wanted five bucks for a balloon. I'm like, no way. So we went to Family Dollar. There were two bucks there. Um, I ended up getting both two balloons, one for Elizabeth because she wasn't with us. But 
in doing that, I was also thinking, you know, God is good to us. Could Andrew have been more careful with the balloon? Probably. All right? Yeah. I wasn't driving, so that... <laughs> But the reality is, God still cares for us. And even sometimes in the most trivial things, when we blow it, when we're not as careful with the balloon as we should be. Um, second question, how does Abraham's sojourning serve as a means of understanding our own walk of faith? Okay. Who here to say, can say that you know more about God today than you did 20 years ago? Okay? Right? We're all in a growth process, aren't we? It's a sojourning of faith. And we can, in some ways, I guess we can accelerate it by responding quickly to God. And we can stunt it by not responding to God. But we're all on a journey of faith. And the more we know of who God is, encourages us to live in light of that. And so often we're tempted not to. So We'll end here for today, and next week we'll pick up with point four throughout the Bible. Um, let me make a note of that. Throughout the Bible. Comments or questions before we close? No, good point. No Sunday school next week. So in two weeks, we will pick up here. Uh, we'll worry about that later, Leroy. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the day you've given us. We thank you for your word. And Lord, we so readily identify with Abraham. We see our own sin and our own failure. Lord, this week, would you help us to keep our eyes fixed on you? Would we live in light of that? Would we live in light of our communion with you? Lord, would every thought and imagination of our heart be continually given over to you? We ask that you bless the service to follow. Would you meet with us in your son's name? Amen.